episode one of the Dan John Workouts podcast. I guess we'll, uh, I guess, uh, first off, I'll start with kind of the inspiration for this was I was reading Never Let Go Again. And you've got a chapter in there about a young man that uh, wanted to interview you or wanted some advice for something. And you invited him to dinner with you and some of your coaching friends. I can't remember the specifics. Oh, of yeah, sure. Yeah. And I, I was thinking in that story, I mean, the, the sentiment of that story was that this young kid didn't really know the value that he was missing out on from that conversation. Because he didn't know. Right. And so my, my kind of thought with doing this was obviously me being the more of the younger person in this conversation, just give you an opportunity to kind of talk about strength and fitness and life and all of the things that are important to you and give people an opportunity to listen to those conversations and hopefully gain some value and learn from those rather than letting them pass by. So that was kind of where I got that idea for this podcast. It was, uh, it was, it was based on uh, queer eye for the straight guy. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, do you want to talk about it? Sure. Yeah. Let's, yeah. We'll yes, start uh, we're at uh, discus camp down at the web in LA. And the guy who ran it said, my son is a strength coach. I go, wow, because that's kind of cool. And, you know, and, you know, every strength coach I know is a friend. Well, he's about 18 years old. And he, and he goes, well, and a kid comes in. And he might have been a strength coach. I don't know if he's ever lifted a weight. So he didn't exactly uh, reflect what you normally see in someone who uh, lifts weights. Right. Uh, some sign of lifting weights. And uh, so he comes in and he goes, yeah, i got this whole book. And basically, it, he wants to write a book on strength training for martial arts. And I, and I start to go through all the books that have already been written on that. And I go, so what, what's your, you know, what's your unique thing? And he goes, well, and it's like, honestly, it's three sets of eight, you know, three sets of 10 in the curl, five sets of 10 in the tricep extension to help with the finish. Because he thought yeah. that you know, that's how you punch somebody. And it was just a straight up crappy bodybuilding program that you would have pulled out of Muscle and Fitness magazine back in 1981, you know, with uh, three different kinds of reverse curls and, you know, wrist curls and all the nonsense. And I said, well, come hang out with this tonight. Well, Professor Tom Fahey was in town, who is basically the guy who's written the, mo the best-selling exercise phys book of all time. Okay. Uh, Pavel Satsuline and, I, and then myself, we're going to meet up in this place called The Cabin and just talk for a couple hours. So I felt bad for Tom because we kept you, Tom would ask a question. And he, when you're with strength coaches, you don't get a lecture; you get a hands-on. So right. this guy, he's probably 66 at the time, and this poor guy, we're having to do goblin squats and holding tension, blowing off tension, all these drills and skills. And poor Tom basically missed the next day, morning because he he goes, I was exhausted; I couldn't wake up. Right. And this morning at breakfast, I said to the young man, I go, well, "What did you think?" He goes, "That's cool." And I thought to myself, in, in hindsight now, you look back. So this is before I'd written a book. So I've got 14 books now. Right. Powell's probably in the same ballpark. You know, you've got literally three best-selling authors who are strength coaches. Uh, in my case at the time, probably 30-ish years of strength coaching. Tom, uh, at the time, probably 40. Powell, at the time, probably 10. All this Western... Russian knowledge, martial arts, discus throwing, elite performance. You know, Tom was telling stories about the four time Olympic discus champion, Al Order, about things he learned. And the kid says, yeah, That's pretty good. Because he wasn't ready. Right. Now, uh, it's one of those things that happens a lot. I have my own story if you want me to keep going. My yeah. sophomore, I threw 108 feet, three inches in the discus, and I took third. Because first place was John Powell, fresh off the Olympics. Second place was Tim Vollmer, fresh off the Olympics. And there's only three of us, so I got third. Damn. And I asked it's about throwing, and guess what I didn't do? I didn't write it down. All right. And I, and I look back on that day, and I go, you didn't know what you didn't know. Right. And that might be, you know, it's uh, it, it's been said a million times. I believe Socrates said it first, but, you know, there's a circle, and what's inside the circle is what you know. Right. And then there's this line that's what, and then outside the circle is what you don't know. And the line is everything you know that you don't know. 
Right. The problem is, as you learn more and more and more, the more you realize about what you know, you don't know. Right. I'm, I'm reading a book called, uh, the guy's name is Montel Bro. He was the guy who basically came up with the concept of fractals. And I'm reading this book, and almost every page, it's like I know what he's talking about on fractals, but it's high-end Einsteinian quantum. There's quantum fitness on one set, and there's Einstein in the second, and having breakfast. You know, the next one, they're talking about the Manhattan Project. The next sentence is talking about this art museum they went to. The next one is listening to Beethoven. And I'm sitting myself going, you know, I know all this, but mostly I know what I don't know here. Right, yeah. And when it comes to the world, our world of fitness and performance, uh, as you expand, the, the, the humbler and humbler you should get. Right. It was, it was funny, just before he logged on, I was watching a video of this guy who knows everything. And I've watched him in his career shrink. So he's an absolute ex, ex, you know, he's an expert on this little tiny dot. You know, right. sad to watch it happen because, uh, you know, he's always right. He's always right. Everybody else is always wrong. Right. He doesn't research. He doesn't believe in science. He doesn't believe in other people's experience. He's always right. Kind of funny. I hope I'm, I hope I don't get that way. Right. You're always right. Um, but it's it's it is a thing in in our field where people think that. Uh, they get to a certain po point where they're absolutely convinced they're right. That's a yeah. tough lesson. Yeah, it is. I think uh, it will, you could, this would be a good segue into something else that I think is valuable for people to learn, for, especially from you, because you're so well read and you stay reading constantly, is how you avoid that, at least it's been my experience, is that you have to keep exposing yourself to new ideas and new things. Um, and of course, even with your wandering weights, you're constantly reading new articles, reading new ideas, reading old articles and exposing them again. Is that what you think is the best way to prevent that arrogance, I guess? Well, uh, certainly being well-read is important. Uh, having people give you books. I'm very fortunate. People will give me, read this book, I think you'll like it. And then I do. Uh, the other one, of course, is travel. Yeah. You know, whenever I kind of hang around people who are very narrow, They'll, they'll be very dismissive about international travel, especially. Mm -hmm. But one of the things you find out, you know, like last year I was at, uh, in Western Ireland, it's called Galway, at Connick Rugby, and uh, the strength coaches invited me over day, and it was fantastic, of course. But when you hang out with the strength coaches at Connick Rugby, you see their facilities and see the athletes they work with. It reinforces some things and it also rips holes in what you believe. Right. You know, it just rips open holes. You know, they're doing a they're they're doing a training, and uh, you know, Johnny Johnny leans over and says, "I don't know why he's doing that." And I kind of lean over and go, "You know, will it get fixed?" He goes, "No, he just won't be around here very long." Because at the highest end, we we told you once, we told you twice. We'll let somebody else tell you now. Bye bye. You yeah. know. Yeah. And that forces some things like with my work with the military you know we always say that the enemy has a vote so right. uh, i would say when in doubt reading number two uh, quality viewing so that can be movies and it can be documentaries and it can be television shows mm -hmm. but like, the quality i mean you know right yeah last night at the i, I played bingo on tuesday nights and there was a uh, a great tennis match going on. There was another thing, and the show about The Bachelor was on. And I thought to myself, people who watch those shows like The Bachelor and all those shows, it's not quality TV. It's just garbage. It's it, it, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe keeping up with the Kardashians is something I should be more familiar with mm -hmm. because they certainly are more famous than I ever. And then the third, if you can, is travel, especially international. Yeah. Uh, when you, uh, it's funny because the first thing you do when you get to another country is you go through customs, and right. but on the whole trip it's still customs. Um, yeah. You know, in Israel, uh, you leave food on your plate when you're done eating. Mm, right. Yeah. If you empty your plate, they'll put more food on. Right. Uh, customs, something that simple. Yeah. You know, uh, what's offensive in some parts of the world is not offensive in others, yeah. and one of the things you learn 
Like Tiff and I come home from countries all the time and radically change the way we do something like in our kitchen or something like that. Right. Um, yeah. In fact, I can probably walk you through the kitchen and say, okay, I learned this in Ireland. I got this from th uh, this place. I learned that in that place. Much more efficient ways to eat and drink and serve. Yeah. 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 That's great. So touching on the, on the fitness side, since you've been to so many different places at a high level from a strength and conditioning standpoint, so are there any major differences that you've noticed in the rugby teams versus, say, the NFL or something like that in terms of the way people are doing things? Well, it's funny because my intern, Lacey, said something interesting uh, about a group she was working with. When you work with a certain kind of athlete, when they walk in the room, they just walk in more athletically. Right. And then when you step down a notch or two, when they walk into the room, they don't walk into the room as well. Mm. Uh, my old track coach, uh, the assistant track coach at Utah State when I was there, uh, Kevin, Kevin uh, uh, Brady, said to me a story about a friend of his at the 64 Olympics. When the Hungarian guy, the hammer thrower, walked into the stadium, walked, the New Zealand athlete said, he's better than I am. Mm. Just looked right. Right. It is walk. Well, you just sit back and you go, well, that's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy until you start hearing and reading this all the time. There's yeah. a certain look. There's a certain look elite athletes have. Yeah. Uh, they, they pick up movements quickly. Uh, they're much more efficient. Um, yeah. I constantly try to remind athletes, uh, I can call it quiet head. How quiet the head is of an efficient, good athlete. You yeah. know, if you're watching, even something as simple as a kettlebell snatch test. The lousy ones' heads are all over the place. The people dominating, the head is quiet. Right. Uh, the eyes are quiet. You know, I tell people eyes on horizon as the clue for the kind of ballistics. Mm -hmm. Just blank stare off. Yeah. The people who are not doing well. So there is a certain quietness in movement. There's a certain solidarity in the box on the on the bowl, the rib cage on the pelvis. Yeah. Uh, the lack of wasted movement. But you don't notice it until you slide back to the other groups. Right, until you see somebody that's not doing it. So yeah. that, that brings up an interesting idea between, because you're always talking about the one piece and making your body one piece. But in a sense, athletes like that, they almost seem like they're isolating something. So like with the snatch test, if their head's not moving, it's because everything else is, or I guess the easier way to think about it is the head is isolated from everything else. But the only way to do that is to be, one piece, right? One piece. You know, your chin, sternum, and zipper are in one line. Right. Your eyes are gazed off, you know. Um, all the energy is going into flipping that out and then flip, throwing it back down. Flip, throw, flip, throw, flip, throw. And your 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 is going along with it, you know. Uh, I've told people before, and they think it's strange, but I say, just go with me to a track meet. You don't know anything about the hammer, javelin, shot, discus. I don't care. I want you to watch the first round and then mm -hmm. tell me who's going to win. Don't listen to a single mark. Don't look at the implement in the air. Right. And they'll usually say, well, that person's technique is really pretty. Hmm. That person also is ahead by 20 meters. Right. If, because we see the efficiency in the grace. Uh, right. I used to emphasize that a lot more Mark, my Early in the decade, that was a part of every talk was grace and efficiency. Right. You know, you should be constantly searching for more graceful movement. Efficiency is when you lop off all the nonsense. Mm. And, you know, it's funny because I even start with simple things like, you know, you have this little ritual you have to do before you compete. Well, one of my jobs as, a, as, a, as your coach is to eliminate that ritual. And okay. your ritual is going to be a checklist. I have my sh throwing shoes. I have a discus. I have my uniform. Um, that's my ritual. Yeah. I'm ready. I don't need to tap myself, you know, pull my gloves up, pull my gloves down, pull this here, pull that there. Because yeah. there's going to come a time. Now, maybe you can get away with American baseball. But in most sports, you don't have a time, time sometimes to run through your little ritual. Right. You know? They, in fact, uh, I tell this to people all the time. That's why I love American football. You know, you be standing around picking your nose, and all of a sudden you're hearing your last name, and all of a sudden you're in. 
You know, yep. the start got hurt, now you're playing. Yep. Well, coach, I need to do my 12 minutes of original strength, my yoga. I like to do some breathing, my crocodile breathing. Yeah, well, that's great. You now have 20 seconds to get out of the field. 15, yeah. 10. And that, that's a real eye opener. So what you want to do is cut. Cut away the nonsense. And, and that, to me, is what an elite athlete does. So are you coaching people to do that when you're training them? If you see them doing those rituals in the gym, you're saying, you don't need to do that? And... No, well, in the discus, and well, in the throws world, I have what's called a one throws competition. Ah, right, yeah. Instead of having six throws, you get one. And I say, I don't care what you're doing, but we're going to have a competition today. It starts at 2 o'clock. I don't care. You, when I walk out there, you have to be ready to go. If you need to take 500 throws, take 500. Um, and then I take the most elite athlete and I give them even more stress. Okay. Uh, with Paul Northway, famously, I posted the results. He didn't throw well. And he walked up and ripped it off the wall. That's when you know you have an athlete. That's when you know you have a tiger. Okay. But what you do sometimes is you uh, change the parameters. You know, uh, right before you, Brian, get in the ring, I might say, well, well stop, stop, stop. We're running 200 meters. You have to get down on one knee, because that does happen at track meets. Right. Or famously, uh, my one of my female high jumpers lost a state championship as she's getting ready to take the jump that would have made her state champion. Some jackass photographer got uh, hit by a javelin because he was not paying attention in the javelin sector. So we had about an hour and 15 minute ambulance issue, and then she, and then the judge said, "Okay, jump." She's ready to go an hour and 15. Well, right. I, I, Cold and distracted and everything else. Yeah. yeah the guy who was a photographer of the Ogden Standard Examiner. I remember this. I'm going to find him one day and I'm going to hurt him. <laughs> State championship. How do you prepare for that? I don't know either. Right. I don't know either. Uh, I don't know how you prepare for, you know, you know, the Seahawks have the Super Bowl one. All they got to give it the ball to is probably one of the greatest running backs in the history of the league. Instead, they try a little slant pass that gets picked off. How do you pick up the next season after that? The Atlanta Falcons are up way up on the New England Patriots. Yeah. And they, they get, you know, and if you watch the video, they start getting cocky on the sidelines, making fun of Tom Brady. And it's like, oh, don't make fun of Tom Brady. Yeah. Okay. How do you come back the next season after that? Right. Well, both times, they didn't. Right. Um, but, you know, that's why I think sports is so good for life. You mm. know? Uh, life is going to punch you in the face. You know, yeah. It does. It, it, yeah. it knocks you down. And my job as your coach is to make you a little bit more prepared for that day where you have the flu and you're taking the final exam for medical school. That's my job. Right. You know, I was to show up and do it. Yeah. Just like you did at the state championship when it started to snow and you stepped in the ring or did your long jump or whatever. Yeah. One of the big things that I've realized, especially over the last few years, having gotten punched in the face a few times by life, is that even though some of those big events, state championships, Super Bowls, whatever, you might not ever get that chance again, but you're going to get another chance at something else. So you still got to wake up and do it again tomorrow, get back to the gym or back to work or whatever it might be. But you're going to have something else tomorrow. So try again. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, that's my dog informing me that, oh, the mailman had the audacity to show up uh, in front of the house. Yeah. So, yeah, actually, it's, you know, that's why I think in, in some cases, especially former female athletes, make very good parents. Mm. Very good parents because they've learned to, you know, step back up. And uh, I would like to say the new generation of uh, male adults. Or, or better parents, but you know that's always you never know. You never know. Yep. Uh, try to live, try to live through your children's uh, yeah. success. Yeah. Ah, so no, you're right. Yeah. So something along those lines, then, that I always think about, and curious to hear your take, especially having worked with so many of athletes at all various levels, is what kind of value do you get out of those those failures? So when Paul Northway did that poor throw and it got posted, and he got upset. Did that failure make him better? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I've had athletes bomb out at the state. I've had athletes bomb out at the nationals. I've had an athlete 
should should have made this magical thing and didn't. And <clears throat> sometimes it becomes a rallying point that they become highly successful in other areas of their life. Mm, yeah. You know, and that's what I want, of course. Right. And in some cases, they learn the lessons of too much tension, too much arousal, and learn to dial it down or not enough and learn to dial it up. So, yeah, those some of the lessons carry over within weeks. Some of the lessons carry over in decades. Got it. Yeah. I don't know if you read it in my I wrote a book called 40 Years with the Whistle. Mm. And I talk about uh, my 10 highlights of my athletic career. Most of them aren't really victories. Two of them are intramural softball games. Uh, one's a county rec league football. But it doesn't matter. Right. Those were, you said highlights, and those were highlights. Right. You know, you know uh, these are highlights, and sometimes in the distance, they're not championships. They're, they're, they're second place, third place. doesn't matter. Right. The score is more important. Right. And, you know, um, there's a real good chance I'm not going to be the wealthiest person on the planet Earth. You know, not, and I'm actually okay with that. But it doesn't mean I can't be wealthy. Right. Uh, I'm not the smartest person on the planet Earth. Doesn't mean I can't be smart or, you know, successful or, 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 you know. Right. You know, I watch these television fathers and they're always so good, you know. Well, maybe I'm not as good as, you know, Richie Cunningham's dad on Happy Days, but I'm a good dad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Perspectives. Yeah. It's, it's just hard. Oh, yeah. It's good. It takes time and experience, right? Yeah. Good. Um, so when we were talking beforehand, so we, we posted some questions or we posted an invitation for questions up on Facebook and we got a few, uh, but you had also mentioned that you wanted to kind of go over some basics and talk about fundamentals and you had some topics that you were interested in discussing as well. Well, let's uh, answer the questions first okay. and then we'll uh, go slide from there. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So uh, most of these came from the strength coach, Dan John strength coach Facebook okay. page. That's a good place for anybody to ask questions. Feel free to post them on there. Uh, so this first one is from Petri. When talking about building a foundation for training, I would say, echoing your ideas here, that the true foundation isn't in the technique and repetitions, but how well you know yourself as a person and how well you know your roots, your loved ones, history, art, spirituality, etc. How well you orient yourself in the world is half the battle. How do you see it? Well, you basically just uh, echoed uh, Epstein's book, uh, The Sporting Gene. It's mm. genetics and geography. And there are, if you want to be elite at certain things, you, you got to be born. And then you also be born in the right place. Yeah. So you got to have the DNA and you got to have be, to be at the right place. You know, Federer's mom was a tennis pro who didn't want her son to advance up too quickly. So. She made him play badminton and soccer. Of course, he loves those other sports. And he's had a pretty good career. I don't mm -hmm. know how he did last night. I, never, I didn't finish watching it. But, um, you know, but having a tennis pro for a mom kind of indi indicates he had a little bit of help. I'm the youngest of six, and I hit puberty late. So my ability to, you know, catch up is, I think, my greatest strength. Mm. Our family uh, motto is it's not where you start, it's where you finish. Right. Well, that's my life story. So yes, th th that is correct. Uh, you know, your limb length, your fast twitch muscle fibers, the way you the way you tick, these are all keys. Yes, but you also have to know you have to know who you are. What, right. But what, what's new with that? Right. Now, as I always tell people, and this is something I, I don't necessarily disagree with the unexamined life is not worth living. But if you examine it too close, you kind of get in the way of your own athletic ability. Mm. Uh, I was telling someone yesterday, uh, a friend of mine took a psychology class and they did this drill. And halfway through the drill, uh, he began sobbing. I won't, I won't be too specific here. And the, the instructor said, well, that's because you have you know, some deep-seated issues. Well, the joke always in medical school is that, you know, the first year they tell you the problems, the second year they tell you how to fix them. Mm -hmm. Well, telling, telling an elite athlete they have deep-seated psychological issues 
don't. Because right. those seated psychological issues is what makes great athletes. Right. Very rarely have I ever had a great athlete who was, <laughs> I don't even know if I've ever had one, who was just like, oh yeah, life's great, coach. Uh, everything's wonderful. You right. gotta have, you gotta have something in your life. Yeah. Um, a fight. A young lady said to me not long ago, she's a hypnotherapist. She said, I'd sure like to work with some of your guys. And I said to her, well, these guys are multi-million dollar assets. The last thing I want you is tweaking That's around with your brain. Yeah. And you know, all of a sudden, you know, they start singing Kumbaya, you know, on a stairwell. I don't, that's not what we want. Right. We hire them to do a specific job that right. other people don't want to do. Right. So don't, you know, don't mess it up. Yeah. Right. After they retire, then we'll talk. After they retire, then we can do all the guitar playing we want. Right. Yeah. You know, we had a string of uh, uh, discus champions at the school I taught. And part of the reason is it was the school I taught at. Right. I, you can certainly use fine young people, but it didn't help that I was, you know, teaching. Right. I, I remember watching, maybe it was a TED Talk or some book on talent. I can't remember which. Uh, but they were talking about why, uh, why world records were being broken. And, of course, oddly enough, one of the, the primary focuses were things like technology. So... The swimming records broke when when we added deep pools at both ends and when we added uh, weight distribution, things like that. And that's what right. caught a lot of it. But a lot of it in things like the NBA was money being fed into certain things, which uh, picked the pool that you were going to go into. So I, I know you've talked about this before, is that if you put the NFL players into Olympic, Olympic weightlifting, we would break records pretty quick. But there's no money in Olympic weightlifting, so the best athletes are going to go to the NFL. Well, right? or in the throws. I mean, yeah. imagine if you know our best uh, shot putters got a, a quarter of a billion dollars, like a Right. Well, those six foot five guys who are just born better are going to be throwing the shot numbers we can't even imagine. Right. But yeah. I think you were listening to Epstein's uh, TED Talk, uh, Sporting Gene, uh, yeah. where he talks about the difference between. Uh, uh, Jesse Owens and Usain Bolt, and he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. But Jesse Owens, 1936, running on dirt, where he had to dig his own uh, blocks, yep. and Usain Bolt's difference is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, that was probably it then, yeah. Uh, it's, it, it's amazing how little we've actually changed in, yeah. well, over time. Most agree that, you know, ever since the, well, the anabolic age is still around, but since, you know, the over, uh, uh, the eighties, uh, world records, you know, uh, Jurgen Schultz, you know, 243 foot discus throwing, you know, that, that won't be broken. Uh, it's weird to think Sadiq's, uh, 286 hammer throw, uh, every, there's been so many opportunities, better throwers, more meets, better facilities. No one's even sniffed it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is, it, it, you know, my friend Mike Powell, now his long jump record is now the longest in history, I think. The longest held. I mean, I'll, okay, real quick. Here's here's your world record holder in, in, the, in, the, in the long jump. Okay, ready? Yeah. Jesse Jones, Bob Beeman. There might be one of them. Bob Beeman, Mike Powell. But the, there might have been Ralph Boston, but I think it goes just like that. That's yeah. it. I just gave you the long jump history, 1936 to 2019. Yeah. Uh, there, there are certain limits that we're just not going to. Uh, do you think a lot of that has to do with the uh, purity is the wrong word, but m maybe it's maybe it's not. Maybe it's the right word. The purity of the. Sure. So like with a throw, like a shot put, there's not a lot of technology that goes into the shot put. It's either. Yeah. And that's why I always tell people if it works in track and field, whatever it is. Right. You stop. Right. Because track and field is. I, and, and again, I'm a track guy, so a lot of you might be listening to poo poo, but it's true. If it improves in track and field, it's right. Yeah. Because there's just no other. That's okay. That's that worked. Yeah. So what do you do? That. You know? There you go. And and if you read the Wizard of Foz, the book about Dick Fosbury, his coach Bernie Wagner did everything he could to get him to stop doing his technique. Right. After. Became the uh, world record holder and Olympic champion, Bernie Wagner toured the country teaching the method that wow. he was absolutely against. Right. Not, 
step on a dead guy, but that's one of those hmm things that make you go hmm. Yeah. Uh, versus my coach, Coach Mon, you know, LJ Sylvester comes back after a weekend and says, Coach, I added 20 feet to my throw. Coach Mon says, stop practice. What did you do? Right. They revolutionized the discus throw. Right. Because it works in the discus throw. It works. Okay. Let's go into the next question. Mike asks, Dan, can you recommend a training program to help a 50 plus aged man who needs to lose 20 pounds of body fat, current weight 194, train four times a week, but without a set program to maintain health and fitness? Okay, so you can stop right there. Yep. Workouts are going to be secondary. Got it. Now, having said that, maybe there's a website where you can type in what equipment he has, put in, I would suggest for workouts, Press park bench workout, press four days a week, put in the equipment you have, and just follow that. Yeah. If it's weight loss, it's nutritional and diet stuff. Okay. Uh, if you can, get a chance, look up Longo uh, Valter, V-A-L-T-E-R, Longo, L-O-G-O, uh, his longevity diet. Try it first, his fast mimicking diet. Try it one time. And do a before and after weigh-in. Uh, I'll tell you, Brian, this has been an, an amazing thing for me. And I'm just, this is me and people I work with. Doing that five-day fast mimicking diet has been a game changer for abdominal fat. Okay. And long as all the research, we're just stealing it from them, okay? Perfect. Uh, it's been absolutely stunning. So uh, it's, but it's, so it's a five-day program? How long, how long is this diet? It's five days. Okay. Five days once a month. Now, at some level, it's going to be cal caloric restriction. But I have found, for whatever reason, that that five-day window, that five-day, uh, you can look it up online. Uh, in back issues of wandering weights, I cover it in great detail. Um, and Nick, we could even put up that stuff up on the site for them, too. Certainly. Just links, like, right? Yeah. Uh, just links. Um, and what's, what's amazing is I... Listen, I've, I've done everything. Uh, Atkins works, of course. Low carb works really well. High carb works. If you're taking care of your protein, veggies, and water, those are the three. Those are the big houses. After that, any any extra carb you throw on there is just sugar. Right. Having said having said that, and I'd love you to make a, a commitment to eating eight different vegetables a day for the rest of your life. I'd like you to make a commitment to drinking lots of water for the rest of your life, quality protein. But what seems to work even better, oddly, is this fast mimicking diet. And I'm not selling it. I'm giving it away. Buy his book. Uh, it's also in the book Spring Chicken, one of my favorite books of all time, uh, Gouillard's book. Um, it's, it's, the diet continues to work weeks after you do it. It seems to change the abdominal fat issue, which most people want to deal with. Yeah. Uh, obviously, eating your vegetables, obviously, drinking your water, some level of exercise, but you cannot. The reason you want to exercise is for the hormonal cascade you get from exercise. Right. But, for the, but with fat loss, it has to be some kind of gear change in your body. Right. Chlor some kind of lowering the calories, caloric deficit. But it eat more, eat less, sorry, eat less, move more doesn't seem to work. And the other thing that I would like you to think about working at, and this is the reason I think that this works so well, is I think the five day fast mimicking diet, it's basically veggies, nuts, and olives. And my thinking now, Brian, is this is that it changes your butt your your gut bio. Mm, yeah. I'm thinking five days without protein, five days without crap sugar, without, you know, really anything. I think it gives your body, your, your, your belly biome a chance to reboot. Interesting. And boy, that might be the answer by itself. And here's another thing that, you know, if you're on antidepressants, you, you got to deal with that. Uh, yeah. There's, there's a lot of drugs here that, that people are taking that make it very difficult to uh, 
lose body fat. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I tell, if, if you're a woman uh, over the age of 30, I would love to see your hormonal profiles taken. Mm. Uh, of course, you know, my wife, I don't know if you follow my Instagram, but, uh, you know, she had that substernal goiter that we just missed for five years. So she had to have an emergency thyroidectomy. So now that she's on these thyroid pills, I have a different wife again. I have my old wife. Again. Right. She looks better. Her skin's better. She's happy again. Uh, if your hormones aren't, aren't lining up, I did not say hormone replacement therapy. Right. I said, let's find out first what's going on. Yeah. And if, if there is something broken at the hormonal level, let's not talk about five sets of two yet. Let's keep right. talking about getting that. So when I advise females now, that's one of the first things I do. Interesting, I get nothing but pushback from them. Yeah. Until they yeah. see some of the women I've worked with, and then they're like, oh, what was that again? I'm sorry. What was right. that thing about? Yeah. That thing I told you? Yeah. That, that's. People are funny. If it was in a pill and I sold it to you, you would take it. But if I say something as simple as go get a go get a go to the doctor, get a hormone profile, it's like, wait, what? What do I got to do? Here, here, I'll get, here, let me get my phone. Okay, I'll call you for it. In yeah. fact, that's what I advise trainers to do now. Don't say go see a doctor. Uh, have a working relationship with a medical doctor and call the doctor yeah, instead. Right. Of, yeah, yeah. If a person doesn't go to the dentist, like I have Doctor Spangler who takes any patient I send. Yeah. Um, uh, you have an appointment next Tuesday at 2 o'clock for uh, yeah, a dentist. Cancel our workout and go to the dentist. That's far more important. Yeah. yeah. It's funny you mentioned the, the taking the pills thing. I think the research, it's been a while since I've, I've read about it, but even if it's a life-saving drug that you need to take for your heart or you're going to die, people take it 50% of the time is what the stats come out of. Well, you know now that... Yeah, so you were talking if people if if there was a pill people would take it even that they wouldn't take it actually i should think that through because you're right because you know chemotherapy because it makes you want to vomit they now test you to make sure you've taken your chemotherapy pills and right. here's something i didn't know and this started in nevada is that before they'll give you opium opioids mm -hmm. grandma's and opioids grandma has to get tested every month now for to make sure there's opioids in her system because what was happening is grandma says I was in pain, gets a hundred uh, opioids, and then you know gives them to grandson who sells them on the street. And they go fifty fifty. Right. And I'm sitting here when this person explaining to me, going, "What?" And uh, he goes, "Oh yeah, uh, grandma. Grandma is one of the big pushers in America now." I'm like, on the list of things I did not expect to hear this week. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So she's giving her six hundred bucks a month. Her pills are worth. 7500 bucks she's she's pushing yeah makes sense well that, that's good so figure out go to the doctor first figure out what's on the list and then address the workout stuff it's always the way it is is the workouts always seem to be the generally speaking the least problematic thing going on there's something else in the life something else with the health that mm -hmm. needs to be addressed before we worry about reps and but once you balance the hormones once you get the sleep, you know, here's the other thing, hormones, yeah. sleep. Yeah. Uh, it's. A, I always tell people it's a vicious cycle this way. That I call it toilet mowing. Yeah. But it's also a vicious, it's a wonderful spiral upper. You get your hormones where they need to be. All of a sudden you sleep sounder. All of a sudden you wake up fresh. You don't feel like bagels. You feel like oh, I'm just I'm motivation to go work out. Yeah. And all of a sudden you whip up. And once you add the workouts up here, then you have, you, you accelerate more. Like in my case, you know, um, I'm going to say pounds, okay, just because it's easier for me, okay? Yeah. Uh, December 18th, I weighed 259 the day before total hip replacement. I'm 223 today. No change in diet, no change in drinking. I sleep better. All of a sudden, my workouts are changing my life. Right. Well, it was the There's lack no pain. of pain. Yeah. I'm pain. I'm not, I'm, I'm not living on cortisol. And I didn't want to. I'm not constantly watching. I'm not red here in my face, although this camera makes me look at I'm not inflamed constantly. Right. What did I change? Got rid of all that arthritis and spurs and whatever else nonsense that was in that in that joint. Yeah.
my problems are in the hazmat uh, bin somewhere, you know. Where they should be. That's good. Leave them there. Okay. Good question. Good. Okay, let's see. Uh, so you mentioned that this this is was a relatively vague question in the Facebook post when you were when you replied to it. So know that coming in. This is from Enrique. How about touching on a workout training program for those that are interested in joining law enforcement, firefighter academy, et cetera? See, that's that's a tough question to answer because um, I need to know what the like what's the minimum standard they have. You know, is it 25 pull-ups? Well, 25 pull-ups and, uh, you know, you got to run uh, 10K in 26 minutes. Well, that's a different standard. You have to be able to swim 1,000 meters uh, towing a bag. Uh, so, so much of it's the standards. Yeah. From the work I've done, generally, you want a very general strength training program. Uh, honestly, if you just listen to good old Marty Gallagher, and just did uh, squat, bench, deadlift. Took him serious. Uh, go, go, go! Follow Marty. Go check his raw R A W, and it's on Iron Company. He has a couple of programs in there. Uh, about three, about three blogs ago. You know, one day a week, two days a week, three days a week. Probably for an academy, I'd say two, two days a week. I would strongly suggest one day. So two days a week. Uh, you know, maybe one day you would just do, oh boy, this would be a hard workout. You would do squat, bench, deadlift, the classic movements for the reps. The other workout, an, an assistance or auxiliary exercise for each one. Okay? Yeah. Tough. This would be a tough two days. Yeah. One day, I strongly recommend you rock. You put 35 pounds in your back, uh, 15 kilos into your backpack, and you go for a long walk. Now, it's not only for uh, cardio, but it's just practice on keep going, keep going. Right. Um, so that's three days a week. I would suggest a mobility flexibility day somewhere in there. And I would say up to an hour or more of just pure flexibility and mobility work. Mobility, right. mobility, mobility. And then the other two days would be, would be the running because running – is a big deal in the academies. You've got to get used, and it's so much of it's garbage running. So right. you have to, you're going to have to have garbage running. Um, that that might be something where a fart lick would come in the way. That's the a, a word that means Finnish. Uh, Swedish means speed play. So right. maybe uh, I don't know. Like I have a park near my house. Uh, maybe do do a nice easy loop, and then there's a hill. There, and there's a figure eight with the hill. Uh, a nice, easy loop to warm up. I go a little faster on the figure eight when it comes to the hill. Go all out at the top of the hill. Do another easy figure eight. Burst up the hill. And then just mix it up, maybe two or three of those. And then just try to get some more garbage mileage in and finish hard a couple of times. 200 meters all out. 400 meters all out, something like that. Yeah. And try and try to have your the cool down be simply the walk back right. uh, because in, in the academy situations, in the boot camp situations, you really don't cool down. You right. just go to the next. Right. There so. you go. I and mean, that's that would be as vague and as general. Uh, one other thing you probably have to do every day is pull ups or push ups. But generally, men don't have to worry about the push up test. Uh, now, if he's European male, you might have to. They, they, they don't do push-ups as well as Americans. But Americans don't do pull-ups as well as they do. So right. every day, uh, explore at least one, two, three sets of pull-ups. Never go to failure. Just practice boom, 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 boom. If 10's your max, do five or six, five or six, five or six, five or six. Just keep greasing the push-up, the pull-up. Uh, on the push-up, you know, do some in the morning and some at night. Don't, don't take it too much. But they're going to be testing you on that, yeah. and you just want to make sure you got your groove going. Perfect. Good. But it is it's tough. Uh, let's see. Next one from John. Need something super basic. I'm morbidly obese, but I'm losing weight fast because I have a serious operation I need to prepare for. Down 35 pounds doing intermittent fasting. Planning on doing kettlebell squats and loaded carries as I improve, including Bulgarian goat whatevers. 
Uh, I actually have a goofy idea to only do kettlebell dumbbell squats until I run out of heavy dumbbells in the gym, then move to double dumbbells and then to barbells until I'm up to 300 pounds or so without, without doing deadlifts or presses just to see what happens. Well, I thought it was a good idea. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, if you take, if you take your goblet squat seriously, your dumbbell squat seriously, that's good stuff. Uh, really? I mean, if you were to tell me you're doing a fat loss program with nothing but high rep squats and loaded carries, my first thought would be, that's really a good idea. Yeah. That's yeah. really a good idea. I would suggest a heart rate monitor. It'd be interesting. Uh, I'd like to see why you're doing those sets of squats. Say if you're doing the 24 kilo goblet squat, uh, you know, and just write down and look down at, you know, rep, oh, I don't know, rep two, three, rep five, rep 10, and see if you can dance and make this into a, uh, a program, my, my thought process, Brian, would be like, uh, you want to ramp that heart rate up to a number. I would use Matthew Tone's number, of course, right. uh, 180 minus your right. age. And then, so that might be eight. Put the bell down when it gets to, in my case, it'd be 118. When it gets to about 100, uh, 160 minus my age, so 98, I pick the thing back up and then just kind of have this. We're going to do, the workout is, 50 goblet squats, but it might be a set of eight, a set of three, a set of four, a set of seven, and it'll be kind of fun. And you're you're in that target heart range the whole time, and you won't ever get yourself where you're just trying to do a rep, which right. I think is a mistake in a fat loss program because the last thing you want is more stress. You got right. the surgery coming up. Obviously, there's issues. Uh, uh, you're overweight. Issues. Stress. Stress. Stress adding the stress of a magic number like 12 versus beep, 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 it's 118. I put the weight down or I don't know how old you are, but, you know, say you're 40. When you get to 140, beep, 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 weight down, beep, 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 pick up, beep, beep, beep. And all you listen to is the beep, beep, beep. Right. So just to summarize, so, so the top end is 180 minus your age, and the bottom end is 180 minus 60. Minus, 60. Minus sorry. Age. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's 20. So you have a 20 uh, beat per minute range that you're trying to stay in. And you would stay in that for a specific number of reps, or would you do that for a specific amount of time? I would say the answer is yes on this one. I okay. think it would be interesting. Uh, it'd be interesting to say if, 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 the, if the, the listener thinks, I'm going to try it for 50 reps or, or like 12 minutes. It'd be interesting to see, you know, it'd be interesting to see because. It would be a good marker. You could use that as a density measure to to, to yes. track another tracker of fitness. So yeah. if it takes you 15 minutes to do 50, and then it takes you 12, you know you're getting stronger. I hope you understood that, uh, listener, is that the, the Brian's point is exactly on. If you do, if you go by time, whatever it is, if reps and time shrink, I'll try to check that. If the reps stay the same or go up and time shrinks, that's more density. Yeah. And density is probably one of the least appreciated things we do in body composition. More work, less time. You know, we had this discussion on the, on the forum not long ago called Easy Cardio. And what's interesting is that, the you know, uh, Maffetone, Phil Maffetone's work, right. the easy, it's called Easy Cardio. Yeah. You know, instead of beating yourself to death to get fit, why don't you just work with what the body's giving you, and then all of a sudden you go in and your time, your time in the 5K dropped. Right. Well, that's in better shape. Yeah. Your time in that sprint triathlon is better. Right. That's good. Yeah. That's very good. You know. Yeah. Um, he has that brilliant test called the MAF test. Uh, I don't know what this letter stands for. I don't remember. But the idea is you walk. It's a three-mile walk. And you have to keep your heart rate in the zone, the 180 minus zone. Yeah. Uh, at the end of every mile, you simply record that mile. So what, he, what the argument is, you know, the first time you do it to stay in the zone, it's 12 minutes, 12 minutes, 12 minutes. And then pretty soon it's, you know, what, 11 minutes, 12 minutes, 13 minutes. Mm. Well, something good. You're just walking. Right. But you're, because you have any kind of measurement. 
And that's the hard thing most people miss is you have to have some kind of measure. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm very lucky as a track athlete. I have this thing called the mark. Yeah. And a stopwatch. And a stopwatch. I, I threw this thing uh, a month ago and it went this far. And I threw this thing this month and it went farther. I got better. Yeah. You can't argue with me. You can't. Because it is right. better. So yeah. uh, when you time things and you have distance, uh, any kind of measurement is always better. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a good answer for that. Yeah. So when... when final tangent on this, and this has been something that I, I don't think that I've heard you talk about too much, but I actually got it from Chris Summers is where I heard it the first time, whereas he'll have his athletes, and again, for those that don't know, Chris Summers is a is an elite uh, gymnastics coach who primarily worked with younger boys uh, in preparation for the national team, and one of the things that he would have is, these are obviously elite athletes to begin with, even at five, six, seven, ten years old is he would have them stay at a weight that seems reasonable that they can do every day. Say they're doing deadlifts. It's a 100-pound kid, and he has them do deadlifts at 135, and that's reasonable for a while. But he'll keep them there for like three months at the exact same weight, never increase, until it's so easy that the kid is irritated beyond measure that he can't increase the weight. He'll say, hold out, hold out, hold out, and he's trying to get it to overcompensate so that it actually gets into that easy phase and it stays easy forever. And then when he finally does increase the weight, he'll make some big jump and go from 135 to 185. And now that's doable. Have you have you ever played with any of this? Like stay with stay with a weight that's reasonable and then stay with it way past the point where it's easy. Yeah. Well, this is back when I was at Utah State and we only had 45 pound plates and 35 pound plates. Do the math. Right. So you gotta, my, yeah. my throat can snatch 115. The bar, 115, 135, 205, or what's 70, 70, whatever, 70, 70. 140, yeah. 185, I have 35s on there. Right. Well, we just didn't have a lot of options. Right. And there was no problem with it. And so that's back, I was actually very influenced at the time. Uh, I, I, do, I, I look back now, I'm kind of proud of some of the stuff. Uh, the, the book, Run run long, run easy, or something like that. Where I realized I just didn't have a lot of opportunities with these freshman throwers. You know, so we did a lot of six sets of three in the hang snatch. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of, you know, um, eight sets of two in the power climb because that's what we had. Well, that little group of guys down the line did really well when the new weight room came in and we had a lot more equipment. Yeah. But up to then, man, you know, we just had what we had. Uh, yes, there is some value to that. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, Pavel and I used to talk about, uh, he he thought you should just train with 45s and 25s. Mm. That's it. So that the jumps are all. So I'm not going to go from 185 in the front squat to 225 unless I know I can master 185. Mm. And what's about that is, you know, and it's true, I've seen this in my own life. The people who believe in microloading and stuff like that, I've just never seen it work. Mm -hmm. You know, what works is when it's at the nationals and I've got to take a lift more than I've ever done to win. And you walk up and you make the damn lift. Right. So in, in those of us in competitive sports, we see it all the time. And that's why I, I got more involved with the easy strength because it reflected more of the realities of what I saw versus what the BS research that people just make up right yeah. right yeah good okay yeah that makes sense it's it's always been my experience as well is that once you once you get good at a specific weight you can usually make a bigger jump than you're expecting if you're patient the, the i think the challenge that a lot of people have is they get impatient and they want to push it up too quickly and then they either get hurt or they get in a position where they're failing reps after reps and it's not they're not making any progress and it takes it gets back to that humility thing that we started with. You have to stay humble enough to stay at a weight that you not, might not like, even right. if that's what's valuable for you. Well, when I first started, we just didn't have adjustable barbells were very rare. Right. Very you know, when Dick Notmeyer had three of them, that was an unusual thing. Yeah. Uh, most schools had uh, fixed barbells. That you could you could not change the weights. Right. And so if you were working out, and also too, they were stuck on racks. 
So you had to pick get, 100. Get, it out, get another rack. Carry it over to what you're going to do, carry it back. And then yeah. when you jump to 120, you also had to pick it up, carry it, you know. So, yeah, it was a different world. Uh, better or worse, richer or poorer, I don't know. But right. it was it's interesting, yeah. yeah. Okay, so back to fat loss. Keep doing what you're doing. Try the uh, fasting diet. Yeah. I might be mixing them now. Uh -oh. Mostly right. with this. Just keep on keep on going. Play yeah. around with heart rate monitor, though. And yeah. do make sure you have that... Uh, Make sure you get some heart, get your, get your heart back to it. Okay? So I'm sure your dog's going to take care of that. Good. Excellent. Well, that was good. That was the, the most of the, the better questions I think that we got. Okay. Um, so we're about wrapping up, or we've, we've been going about an hour. Is there anything else that you want to go with for now? Uh, not now, but next time, uh, next time I'll, I'll maybe start, we can start talking about the basics and how to do this and how to do that. Perfect. But right, I want to sell. I want to sell the fact that we're very, we're very responsive, and uh, we care, and we answer questions. Okay. Yeah. So sure. everybody, if you got questions? Send them to podcast at danjohnworkouts.com. If you need workouts, danjohnworkouts.com. Feel free to ask questions on Dan John Strength Coach Facebook page. Uh, Dan and I will both be answering regularly as best we can. Uh, and yeah, let us know how we can help. Uh, will be available. So thanks for listening. Thank you.